We are witnessing a disaster of almost unprecedented scale here in Surfside, Florida. Rescuers are racing against time, hoping that some of the missing are still alive. Surfside is a tragedy beyond description. It was a colossal, catastrophic event that was and continues to be. I remember vividly that early morning when we found out the news, how tragic it was. The mere thought of this incredibly difficult event brings a chill to my entire essence. True, there, were, there was many lights within this difficult times, many individuals, many organizations, many people came to help, to search for possible survivors, to help people in crisis just lend a shoulder to cry on. We at High Lifeline were also there. Our entire crisis intervention department was there for days upon days and hours upon hours. But yet, a year later, this devastating, difficult situation still hurts. We think about the orphans. We think about the widows and the widowers and about a community that suffered so greatly. What should our response be? The great Kabbalist, the Toma Devora, writes on the Talmudic statement, Kol Yisrael Arevim Zelazeh, that we all are responsible for one another. It doesn't just mean communal responsibility or fiscal responsibility but rather we need to feel like we are part of the Surfside victims, that we are one with them, that we are together with them. This is our challenge, and this is our goal. Tonight, we will have the privilege of hearing from Rabbi Lipsker, the rabbi of the shul, literally the rabbi at Ground Zero, where many of his congregants were unfortunately victims, and he worked tirelessly for many hours and days in helping the families. We will also have the privilege of hearing from a noted therapist, an inspirational speaker, a great educator, this is Hani Juravel. I hope that we can be able to internalize their messages and we can truly demonstrate the responsibility we have to continue the legacy and the message of Surfside. Hello, everyone. It's very nice to say hello to you from our shul in Surfside, Florida. Particularly at this time, as we are approaching the anniversary, first anniversary of this tragic calamity that shook up our community and changed it, what I believe is, for always. The event that happened here one year ago, with the collapse of the building, sent tremors to such a degree that you felt the effects all over the world. You can imagine being at center point, at point ground zero of the origin of this extraordinary 
calamity and earthquake that shook up the world. I remember distinctly, sometimes in the middle of the night, early, early morning, it was maybe two o'clock, that my phone rang and it was my granddaughter who asked me if I was aware of some emergency that was taking place because the streets were filled with sirens of police and fire trucks. Of course, being our community, I immediately tried to find out what happened and heard there was some commotion of an earthquake, a tragic wave, something that took place in one of the apartments in Surfside. I got into my car and I saw a cloud of dust that covered almost the entire southern half of Surfside on the ocean side. We couldn't approach it too closely because the streets were literally filled with emergency vehicles. And then we heard the unfathomable. A building had collapsed. We didn't understand what that meant. We only knew that it was some tragedy. When, within a few hours, the tragedy's reality became starkly evident to us, you can't imagine the pain that accompanied it. We all had dear friends, neighbors, acquaintances, families that lived in that building and who had relatives who lived in that building. Who was home? Who was not home? What happened? How can we save them? At that time, we felt that there was a strong chance, hopefully, that people would come out alive and that we would be able to see those beloved again. Very quickly, that hope diminished considerably, particularly to the professionals. And literally, when I came to that place and looked over what I saw, it was hard to imagine that any life would be in any way able to withstand that extraordinary difficult time. Unless there was some air pocket that we still hoped for. Maybe somewhere the concrete had landed in a way that somebody could be saved. There were all kinds of rumors. We heard a noise, somebody scratching. We thought we heard someone screaming. It was not easy to determine. We were on the ocean with the waves. People talking all around you. The building settling and crushing. And unfortunately, the reality of that space was very difficult to recognize because there were many things that were beyond anyone's control, like certain fires in certain part of the substructure of the building, flooding, so many factors. Families started to gather. The adjoining neighbors came running out of their buildings. And everyone came to the community center. The community center that night was filled with people. And from that night morning on, throughout the next night, every inch of the floors of every room in the community center was taken up by somebody sitting, laying, standing, sleeping bags, pillows, blankets. <coughs> Everybody in a somber mood that you could not even believe. The tension that was felt in that space was impossible to live with. We were in a twilight zone. <coughs> because 
Every single person in that space was hoping for a miracle. Every time a uniformed person would walk in from the search and rescue teams, everybody would jump up, any news, any news? Did they find someone? And of course, if you were there on the location of what we later refer to as the holy pile, the holy pile, you knew that in a natural way, it was extremely unlikely that we would find too many people or anyone at all. So you couldn't tell them, don't worry about it, we're going to find them. And at the same time, you could not tell them, it's too late, they're not here. There was hope hanging on as the days went by and the nights went by and the hope started to dwindle and the pain started to set in with more intensity. And of course, you're talking about hundreds of people hundreds of families, thousands of individuals, hundreds of people on the search and rescue teams, police fighters, hundreds of people, members of families and friends, hundreds of people as volunteers in every single way. What could we do at that moment? And the shock of the event was of such a nature that it touched the core of everyone's being. And the entire community and everyone here turned into a kind, giving, gentle, accommodating, embracing, loving person. All we did was extend kindness. All we did was give them whatever is possible. A large room that we were in the middle of building, that was a giant space, became filled with all kinds of materials that were necessary, from pillows to blankets to baby food to telephones, computers, food of every type. Organizations started to step in. What can we do? One Israeli organization led by Mr. Zuvalani and his team set up actually a field kitchen in the back of the community center that worked 24 7 supplying food to every single person that needed it in a way that was beyond that which was critical. We fed them the best foods, the best meats, pizza, whatever they wanted, soda, snacks, dinners. And in fact, we were so careful to do what needed to be done in the right way that as you can imagine, non-kosher food, especially meats, are just as tasty to most of these people as kosher food. A lot of them were not even Jewish. But for the Jewish people, we had to bring kosher food, and of course, we brought the best meats, the best steaks, whatever we had. The restaurants gave us, the supply companies gave us. Everybody chipped in. The entire Jewish people became ki ishechot belevechot, like one man with one heart. And we went to such a degree that I told the volunteers in her kitchen, no more non-kosher foods. Everybody's eating kosher, and of course, it was more expensive, but nobody felt this was the kosher table for the Jewish people, and this is a non-kosher table for those who are not kosher. Everybody ate equally, on every level. And we maintained it to such a degree that it was glad kosher and chal of Yisrael, so that there were no questions any time you walked in. I would walk in at four in the morning into that environment where people were laying around and there were people sitting and cooking, and the best chefs in the city, from the highest rated restaurants and places, would come here in their off hours as I watched them in the back, 
cutting the vegetables and preparing the foods. I looked at him, I said, you guys look like you know what you're doing. Go, you know where he is? This guy's a chef and so-and-so. This entire community turned into one big heart. And of course, High Lifeline was a very important part of that. Together with its foundation philosophy of being there for every Jew and for every person that needs some help, in this instance, in terms of counseling and being with people, every single person needed counseling. There was nobody that didn't. It was a shock to the whole system. And as a result, everything elevated in a way that was incredible. The entire world looked at what's going on here and they paid attention. And the one very critical factor that most of us will bypass and not recognize, the fact when something like this happens, you might say, it's a minor holocaust. To the people that were affected, it is a holocaust. Only wasn't perpetrated by an evil human, it was perpetrated by error, but the hand of God in a certain way. Nobody could have avoided it. You go to sleep at night in a safe building with a, with a doorman, and you lay in your own bed in your own bedroom, and then you don't get up. So it's a very difficult process in counseling was a very critical factor in this process. And this kindness extended to such a degree that it brought about a reaction that you might think is just the opposite of what usually should be. As I mentioned, this is a Holocaust. And most people, a lot of people, like I, I would say, would say, where's God? I don't believe him anymore. Get me out of here. I have nothing to do with him anymore. And it would be a rejection of Almighty God. We found in this case that it was just the opposite. People got closer to their spirituality. People became more committed. They had more faith. How did that take place? The extent of, which, of, of how it happened, I'll give you two little examples. One was a senior firefighter, big, big, giant of a man who was part of the team. And I would speak to them from time to time to the entire team in their various groupings, few hundred of them at the time, because at the center of the search and rescue was an Israeli search and rescue team, which was really the head of the program. They revolutionized the whole system of how to search for people in their brilliant way that they did this technologically, structuring and understanding the entire building, who slept where, and wherever they said people should dig and look, that's where they found people. Brilliant. And so on a regular basis, the entire search and rescue would get together in their shifts, about two or three hundred at a time. There were a total of maybe over a thousand in the various working three shifts. Talk to them. At one case, one of these firemen walks over to me and he's all emotional, it was obvious in his face. He said, I want to tell you something, Rabbi. He said, you know, when I was a little boy, I was part of, a, I went to church. He says, after I grew up, it didn't talk to me, it didn't answer my issues. So I became, he said, a Mormon. And pretty soon that didn't answer my question, my issues. And I said, and threw it all out. I took God out of my system, out of my heart, says, and I left it. He says, today, right here, it came back to me. So I want to thank you for it. Another person who lost members of her family, connected to a very high-ranking family in South America, a woman, a non-Jewish woman, when we befriended as she was laying there crying with the pictures of the family every night for a week and a half. She came up to me one day and she said, 
I want to ask you a question. I said, sure. How can I become Jewish? I said, why do you want to become Jewish? She says, where I lived, I never grew up with Jewish people. I didn't know about Jewish people. I just heard about Jewish people, but I didn't understand them. But now I'm lived with Jewish people here, and I see how they are. I want to be Jewish. What caused that connection? What brought about that perception and that commitment? One word. Chesed, kindness, unconditional kindness. And that was awakened in this community. And it opened up a sensitivity that was so incredible that the nations of the world looked upon the Jewish people with respect and with dignity and with an understanding of their sensitivity. So now that we're a year later, the big question is, is this going to be like any other event in history? You get turned on, you get inspired, you get charged, you get shocked. And slowly that motivation wears down and you go back to normal. I know for the first few months, everybody was in this high state of kindness and goodness and togetherness and oneness. Let's not let that dissipate. Let's make sure that we utilize the event that took place here, which is an eternal event. Surfside will always have in its history and in its memory the collapse of Surfside. It will never leave us. Families who suffered losses, those losses will never leave them. The pain will dissipate, but the loss will not. And they will always remember what took place and always live with it. But those of us who were part of this shock and emphasized what was necessary in order to be able to deal with it and did, Let's not make this a one-time event that slowly dissipates and is forgotten about. The inspiration of sensitivity and kindness and sharing and goodness and obviously Israel and love of a fellow Jew and responsibility for a fellow man and making this world a place that God Almighty himself says, these are my children. This is what I created the world for. The origin of the world is kindness. Oilam chesed yibane. The Almighty God sustained the world in kindness. And it's us that he expects to maintain the world on kindness. So to give the mar those who unfortunately are the holy souls who passed away, unfortunately, and their families, a sense of belonging and meaning and the fact that this event did not just happen, let us rethink our inspiration, recommit ourselves to this kindness and do, just ask yourself to do one thing more or one thing better in the world of kindness that you did until today. And then this commemoration will really have proper meaning. And Almighty God will bless each of the family members, each of those who participated, and each of us who are participating in this program will grant us all the blessings that we need. And the ultimate blessing with the coming of Mashiach, our holy Savior, to bring us, Himir Hashem, to our holy Yishalayim Yer HaKadosh with the building of the base of Migdash immediately. So we've been through a really rough couple of years. And I think collectively, we've all been going through the stages of grieving. And there are five stages of, of grief, and we all sort of flip-flop through them in, 
in a pretty messy way, but it's, it's part of being human. We go through denial, just not believing that, that things that happened could have happened. We go through the anger of, of why things like that could have happened to people that were so good and, and so deserving. We go through the, the bargaining of maybe if I do this, it won't happen and we'll be safer and if and then. And we go through the depression, the just maybe I should give up and because there's only bad news. And, and then finally we come to a place of acceptance. And maybe we've sort of settled in at that acceptance, but I think we have to remember that there is now a sixth stage of grief. And that stage that's probably the most critical, especially a year later, especially for thinking people that, that feel, is the stage where we find meaning in what we went through. And uh, I don't pretend to have any answers and a one-size-fits-all mentality of, of where to go with a tragedy this big. But maybe this could give us some, some framework that would prove comforting and, and maybe meaningful. Um, in the beautiful, beautiful love song of Shir HaShirim, where we talk about God's relationship with us, how Hashem loves us and, and what we are to Him, we find two very similar psukim, two very similar sentences in that song. In one we say, Dodi li, my beloved God is to me, va'anilo, and I am his. But then just a few chapters later, we say, anila dodi, I am to him, I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. Why have those two very similar sentences? Because they really refer to very different aspects of our relationship with God. In the first, we're told, it's Hashem proving himself to us. Dodi Li, he's mine. He comes to me in the most revealed, most, most magical of ways. And, and there's no question that, that I'm in, right? I see him, I feel him, I believe in him. That, that's amazing. Then there's a second kind of time. The time where I don't see Hashem. I, I can't make sense of my world. I don't feel him in the way that I'd love to. Things aren't going my way. And as much as it, it's just so hard to be in this relationship, it's a lot harder not to have it. And I realize that there's no way to, to live in this world without him being the end all and be all and, and knowing that he's there for me. So as painful as it is, and as much as I'd want the miracle, I create one on my own. Anila Dodi, I reach out to him, Vidodi Li, and he becomes mine. If you think of times in history where Dodi Li, Va'anilo, times like Hashem proving himself to us in Egypt, times where he, he brought us across the sea on dry land, times where he came to Sinai and, and spoke to us and we felt him and, and we knew he was there, those times of unbelievable, unbelievable special, miraculous effects that proved Hashem to us in ways that were indisputable. The interesting thing, though, is those times didn't last. We left those times with that, with that feeling of, of inspiration, and, and then we sort of you know, went back into spiraling out and, and dancing around a golden calf. The other times in history were times where he really wasn't there in a way that we felt him. Times like the Jews pre Hanukkah or the Jews suffering before Purim. Times where he wasn't on the map and, and we didn't see him in a way that, that was as real. But we made it real because we reached out for him and he became ours in ways that, that did last and are ours forever. So the first set of commandments, the first luchos, they were given to us. Unbelievable example of Dodi Li, right? Hashem is mine. I could hear him. I'm, I'm at this mountain. It's just so miraculous. Anilo, I'm his. The thing is that that didn't last that long. We left those that, that moment at Sinai and we left that clarity and there was a golden calf not long after. The second set of tablets, there was no miracle. 
It was just us Jews wanting Hashem, knowing that our life would be meaningless without Him. And we had to just reach out and beg and yearn. And Anila Dodi, it's when we reached out to Him that He became ours in a way that that, that second set of less miraculous, less perfect tablets is with us forever. Because it's the Anila Dodi times that really define us and define what He means to us in ways that make Hashem, make Hashem ours. So I went to Surfside a couple of months ago. I was working in Florida, and I asked the wonderful woman driving me around if, if she could just take me to that, to that block. And, and it hit me like, like I couldn't imagine, right? It was just so real, that gaping hole and, and thinking about everything that, that was there, all the life and and all the loving people, and all the goodness, and, and all of the, the seeming security that, that's, just, that's just not. To think of, of how devastating that is, it's just, can't even wrap our minds around it. And, and I was just shaking and, and yearning for a moment of, of Dodi Lee, like, just like, what, what? What are we supposed to do with this? How'd this happen? And of course, that, that didn't come. But then after a few minutes, some other images started surfering, surfacing. Not images of Dodi Lee yet, but images of Anila Dodi, of Jews that really sought God in the most complimentary of ways. They started emulating him when they could have just easily given up and <laughs> been angry people, but, but they started being Hashem's emissaries in in such remarkable, remarkable ways, providing the support, providing providing the comfort and and the food and and the housing and the security and, and the helping and the searching and the not giving up, really playing the role of of Hashem in in such an amazingly powerful and humbling way all at once. So we don't have the clarity of Dodi Li Vanilo, but we do, we have proven the feature of Anila Dodi. And I think that we could share that pride with HaKadosh Baruch Hu in such a beautiful way. You know, I, I know that we're all, we're all yearning for miracles now in life. The miracles of just life being back on, on track, of us feeling less susceptible of, uh, of knowing that, that the world is what Hashem always intended it to be. And um, we could feel pretty powerless when it comes to wishing for miracles because it's hard to know how to get them. But maybe there is, there is a way that we could help it along. We know that one of the ways that Hashem runs the world is mida keneged mida, that our actions, kaviacho, elicit his reactions. When we're looking for miracles, what we're looking for is a time where Hashem brings the world to a place that's lima'ala min hateva, beyond what we typically consider natural, bringing it to a place that's beyond what's regular and standard. So uh, to elicit that, I guess it might mean that we have to behave and, and come to places in our life that are beyond what's just natural for us. I think Surfside was one of those places that we proved ourselves to be lama'ala min hateva, beyond what's natural. For people to come from Israel to a different country and search for strangers as, as though they were looking for their brother or best friend, that's not natural. For members of Chai Lifeline to go and, and show support and, and comfort and uproot themselves from their homes for an indefinite amount of time, for people to just give of themselves financially and emotionally and just sit and cry and feel in ways that people don't often do for people they didn't know. That's beyond nature. So maybe we could we could think that, that miracles are going to come. But more importantly, we could know and find meaning in the fact that we proved ourselves in being the types of people that could perform them too. 
And that must make Hashem really proud and hopefully must make all of us that much more ready for the world that, um, that we know could be.